Today we're going to start a very interesting message for our 4th of July. We're going to be talking about the subject, Is America Found in Bible Prophecy? I've studied this topic on and off for several years now, and I have contemplated bringing a message like this several times, but I feel that perhaps now is the time to do so. Let me begin by looking at what the Bible has to say in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 34. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said, in Proverbs 14, verse 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What a verse for us to contemplate our 247th year as a nation here at the 4th of July. Now, the study today is a complicated one. Uh, it has many offshoots and many directions which we could look at. It holds some great depth. It holds a lot of fascinating treasures as we take a look and find out what God's Word says about God's chosen people, the Jews, and about God's redeemed people, the church. And since America became a nation, Bible scholars and students have wondered uh, if America is ever mentioned anywhere in the Holy Bible, but more specifically, their concern is, uh, is there a verse in the Scripture that says that America is going to exist in the end time? Now, surely the most powerful Gentile nation on the earth, a nation that has become a lighthouse uh, to the world, proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think that it would not be omitted from thousands of scriptures that talk about uh, the predictions of the Lord's return and what nations will be in power? Well, most of Bible scholars agree that this is probably one of the most frequently asked questions out of all Bible questions when they get asked. They've, they, they've been asked so many times, is America going to exist in the end times? It's not only the most frequently asked question, but I'm here to tell you today that it is the most difficult question to answer. Most ancient people are empires that are mentioned in Scripture, and they can very easily be traced uh, through Bible prophecy even into this modern day. For example, the present European Union, the EU, is very clearly anticipated in Bible prophecy as a revived form of the culture and the people of the Roman Empire in the last days. Even the city of Rome occupies a very large place in, in uh, the final form of Western power that's protected by and predicted by the Bible. In the same case, same frame, the vast populations of Asia and especially China are predicted under the sphere and power called the King of the East. They're going to occupy a very fearful role in the Battle of Armageddon. All of the nations that surround the reborn state of Israel are named in prophecy in the last days. These nations are all connected today. They're all in existence, and they are all connected by Islam. So we see here that uh, the ancient Hebrew prophets predicted the conspiracy, and his passion to destroy the reborn state of Israel in the last days. And so even the nations that surround Israel are in the scriptures. Ancient nations like Asia and Babylon and Persia can all be tracked across history to the nations present even in the last days. Even ethnic groups can be traced through their forefathers into their modern counter, uh, uh, counterparts. The descendants of Magog can be traced through the Scythians to modern uh, ethnic Russian uh, uh, peoples. And descendants of Cush are modern black Africans. The modern descendants of biblical characters such as Put, P-U-T, are the people of Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. But if you're looking for Bible prophecy, if you look through Bible prophecy for something that can be traced to America so that we can know whether America will be in the last days or not, may I say to you that there just isn't such a reference in all of prophetic scripture. 
So when it comes to answering the question, where is America in Bible prophecy? If you pick up five and read five Christian authors, you're going to get six or seven different opinions about America's role in the latter days or even its existence. That's what makes studying this question so confusing and, and mind-boggling so many times as you study what each person has said. It's why it takes so long to try to put together a teaching that you can bring to the church today and share with you what I feel to be an answer to that question. So after studying and listening to various respective Bible teachers, I think I formed my own opinion about this question, and I'm going to present it to you today, but keep in mind, it is my opinion. Now, I'm basing it on what I've studied, and I'm basing it on what I understand uh, 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 given to me by, I think, the Holy Spirit's teaching and the things which I've read. You know the old saying, there's nothing new under the sun? Or maybe the old saying, everything old is new again? Or how about this one? History has a tendency of repeating itself. Well, folks, I believe that there's a great truth in those sayings because in the Bible, God works the same way. Things in the Old Testament are shadows of things that are going to be in the New Testament. You remember what we often say, that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so you can find patterns and, and cycles that repeat themselves over and over again. And when you begin to see them, you, you gain greater understanding and revelation of how the Bible is a complete whole. So can America be found in the Bible? Well, let me say to you very simply, the answer is both no and yes. That's a simple answer, isn't it? Let's begin with the no answer. Can the Bible, can America be found in the Bible predictively as part of the latter days? The answer is no physically. No physically. Now, as I said before, if you're looking for a clear example or a clear reference to the United States of America in Bible prophecy, you're just not going to be able to find it. There's no verse, there's no reference that you could point to that very clearly says that God is talking about the United States of America. The Bible very clearly identifies who we're going, uh, who we're going, is going to be the, the world power leader in those last days. And folks, it's not America. Not America. According to the prophet Daniel, it's going to be the descendants of those who destroyed the temple in 70 AD. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman general Titus and his 10th legion. So according to Daniel, the global leader in the last days is going to be the descendants of the empire and the people of Rome. Now, the Roman Empire has certainly revived politically, anyway, today in a common uh, uh, modern version which we know as the EU or the European Union. In fact, Russia, China, Iran, Syria, and the whole host of, of most of the world's major nations can be found in the scripture right up to the end. But it's Europe, the EU, it's Europe which the Bible predicts as being the remaining world power, that superpower in the last times, not the United States. Now, some theologians have put up some very compelling arguments that America can be uh, seen in several places among prophetic scriptures. And when you study their theories and the things which they've written and said, I would tend to give them the benefit of the doubt and, and maybe... Uh, that scripture is speaking of America and some of the verses that they talk about. A lot of theories that these scholars point to require symbolism and require allegory. And you can gain a lot of understanding if you're using scripture to explain scripture. But you can get into some major trouble and false understanding of things 
uh, by trying to explain Scripture by using something that lies outside of the Bible. For example, some scholars point to the passage in Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 13, where the prophet Ezekiel talks about the merchants of Tarshish and all of the young lions thereof, who launch a diplomatic protest at the time of the battle of Gog and Magog, which occurs in the middle of the tribulation period. Let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 38, and I want to read for you from verse 13. Ezekiel said, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, and to take great spoil? So they're explaining, these writers, that Tarshish was the westernmost uh, trade and sea port town uh, uh, in all of the ancient world. And from this, they conclude that Tarshish is Britain. That's why they say that Britain is modern-day Tarshish. After all, Britain is the most westernmost point of the continent, and the symbol of Britain is a lion, a lion. And so consequently, the interpretation goes that all of the young lions thereof become all the former British colonies like Australia and Canada and, of course, the United States. Therefore, the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof must be referring to America, they say. Now, this is one of the, the, those maybe and maybe not incidences. I agree that England's symbol is a lion. I agree with them on that. And that it's on the westernmost point of the continent where Britain lies. But this theory is an iffy, is, is, is iffy, because nobody can pinpoint with any degree of accuracy exactly where Tarshish was located. That's the problem. We don't know where Tarshish was located. In fact, most recent archaeological studies uh, put in presently uh, the modern Spain, which would uh, make this theory of it being Britain false. They say Tarshish was located where today we have the country of Spain. So all through the theory, it, it may be possible, it doesn't seem to be very likely unless future archaeologists discover that Tarshish was really in Britain, and then it would make sense. Another theory that's being posted is the wings of an eagle theory. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 13 through 17, takes, uh, it talks about a woman. The woman is Israel, fleeing from the Antichrist and Satan, and halfway through the tribulation period is taken off with wings of eagles. Let me read just verse 14 of Revelation chapter 12. It says in verse 14, And to the woman, Israel, were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a times from the face of the serpent. So they say that since the eagle is a symbol of the United States, that this passage is saying that America is going to provide military aircraft to take the remnants in Israel away to safety during the tribulation period. Now, I'm not saying that that can't happen. I'm not saying that that won't happen. America very well could be used by God during the tribulation period if he wanted to and help save the remnant of Israel, those that have believed in Christ's return. But the argument against this interpretation are very strong, and I think more believable. For example, the first argument being that America is not only a nation in history to ever have an eagle as its national symbol. They say America's symbol is an eagle, and it's the first to have that symbol, they are not the first to have that symbol. The eagle was also a symbol of ancient Rome, if you'll remember. And so using the same reasoning, you could just as well say that the descendants of ancient Rome 
would be the ones that would take the remnant of Israel away into safety. Now, who did we say the remnants of ancient Rome were? They are, of course, Europe or the old Roman Empire, the EU, the European Union. Now, the second and best argument against America being the eagle of this passage has to deal with the fact that Scripture will, can interpret Scripture. The best commentary on Scripture is always Scripture. And the Scripture has already identified who the wings of the evil eagle are. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 9 through 12, God says, Moses says this, but God says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, whose name was Israel, is a lot of his inheritance. He found him in the desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, has instructed, he instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle, he says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. And notice, so the Lord alone did lead him and thee, have no strange gods with me. So from the scripture itself, you can see that God is identifying himself as being the bearer of the remnant of Israel during the tribulation period. So we have to be very careful about signs and symbols to make sure that scripture speaks to scripture. So those are just two of the theories which are out there. There are many, many more that we could talk about, but some are very compelling. Most, if not all, fall under the category of maybe this can happen with America or maybe it can't. So that leads us then to the second point in our message, and it's very simply, yes. Not only no, does America not exist in, in prophecy, but yes, it does exist spiritually. As I said, America can't be easily pointed out in the Bible. We can't trace our national identity or cultural heritage back to ancient times like the countries and the ethnic groups that are named in the scripture that we've already mentioned. We can't look at the passage or look up a verse or a word that says that this is identifying ancient America. After all, we've only existed, as I said, 247 years. So what can we trace how can we trace our spiritual heritage? Uh, America's spiritual heritage existed long before her physical heritage. Before they became a physical nature, we had a spiritual heritage. Our Christian heritage can be traced all the way back to Christ himself. No other nation, no other nation on earth can claim the rich Christian heritage that America can claim. And I believe that, that America was divinely birthed. I believe that America was proposed to, uh, to be nurtured and to spread the gospel message until the time of the end. And our Christian or spiritual heritage is found in the Bible because we're connected as Americans in a very unique way to our spiritual forefathers. We are connected through the Jews. So today I want to give you what I'm calling the theory of God's vineyard. Look with me, if you would, at two passages of Scripture. And you want to open your Bibles and read with me as we go along. The two passages are interconnected. One's in the Old Testament, one's in the New Testament. The first one is in Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah gives us the parable of the vineyard. And in Matthew chapter 21, the other passage, Jesus picks up the parable of the vineyard, but he gives us a part of it that, that Isaiah had left out. Jesus tells us something very important from the parable that's written from Isaiah chapter 5. Let's read what Isaiah had to say. Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved. Touching his vineyard, my well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it 
and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with a choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, twixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I would that I have done, not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. That was the original uh, uh, speaking of the vineyard, the parable of the vineyard given to us by Isaiah. Now we turn over to Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus picks up this same parable. But he adds something to it that helps us to understand something of what's going to happen in the latter days. In Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 33, Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a certain household. Uh, which planted a vineyard and hedged, or hedged it around about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let it out, or rented it out to a husbandman, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman, that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will revere my son, reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. And when the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do with those husbandmen? They said unto him, He will miserably destroy these wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto the husbandmen, which shall render him the fruit of his season. Now I want you to skip down to verse 43 and notice what Jesus said. Therefore, therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing for the fruit thereof. Now the nation of Israel in the scripture is compared to three different trees. It's compared to a fig tree. It's compared to an olive tree. And here it's compared to the vine, the olive vine, or the vine, the grape vine. Even one of these, every one of these trees or bushes represents a different aspect or privilege that God has bestowed on the nation of Israel. In fact, and in this case, the vine that we're talking about represents Israel's spiritual privilege of taking the true knowledge of God and the true knowledge of God's love to the rest of the world. Israel was given that privilege. Israel was the true vine, uh, the true vine of the Almighty in the first parable. No matter how God nurtured it and protected it and taught, uh, God taught them and blessed them, but they still brought forth wild grapes. 
and their continual disobedience to God brought judgment on the vineyard. The Hebrew prophets foresaw a time when God would remove the hedge and allow the vineyard to be trampled upon. And this happened to the nation twice. If you know your history, you know that it happened once in 606 B.C. when they were taken uh, in the invasion of the Babylonians and carried off into captivity. And it happened again in 70 A.D. with the invasion of the Roman 10th uh, Legion as he, as he marched, uh, the general Titus, as he marched and destroyed all of Jerusalem just like Isaiah said it was going to happen in the first parable of Isaiah chapter 5, it did happen and God allowed it. So Jesus picks up and he continues this idea of the vineyard in the parable of Matthew. Here the Jews are the husbandmen, or what we would call today farmers, those who are entrusted by God to spread the love, spread the knowledge of God to the world, and thus bear fruit spiritually among all people. God sent his prophets to them at harvest time to see what fruit they had grown and to warn, uh, warn them uh, and the owners about not being faithful to what God had given them to do. The servants that were spoken of in this parable uh, uh, exemplified the prophets that God sent to the nation also. But the Jews didn't want to share the privilege nor believe that the owner, who is God, remember, that the owner would soon be coming and they were going to have to give an account for what they had done with the vineyard. And so what did they do? They killed the prophets. They killed the messenger of the owner. So God then sent his son, Jesus Christ. He sent his son to them and they decided to kill him in order to keep all the spiritual privileges and the, all the spiritual inheritances for themselves. So look at what Jesus said. Jesus made this announcement in Matthew 21 and verse 43. He said God, God would transfer his vineyard or his spiritual privileges and give it to a nation that would bring forth fruit. Now most scholars say, well, this nation is the church or the body of Christ. When workers in the vineyard killed his son Jesus, the vineyard was given over to others. And God raised up Gentiles to carry the gospel of Christ to the nations of this earth after Christ's death. Uh, and took it away from the religious Jews who had done nothing with it except turn it into, into uh, uh, sour grapes. So just as the priesthood was removed from the Jews and was placed on Christ, who is the eternal high priest. The spiritual privileges of Jewish people were removed and placed on a different people that were to do the work that the Jews had refused to do. This, of course, is our Christian heritage. We, the Gentiles, the church, were given the vineyard and the spiritual privileges that belong to the Jews, in order that we could take the message of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. But I want you to notice, Jesus said that God would let it out, let out the vineyard to a nation. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43. A nation. I believe that word is very chosen. I believe it's very interesting. He didn't say that he would give the vineyard to a people. He said he would give the vineyard to a nation. A nation is a relatively large group of people organized under a single government or a political system. Now, I'd agree that the church is also a large group centered under the Lord Jesus Christ. But a nation usually has physical borders and its entire people living in one general area. Now, could he have also been referring to a physical nation that would carry the gospel of Christ to the world? I don't know for sure. I'll be honest with you. I don't know for sure. Here's another maybe or maybe not. But isn't it interesting, folks? Isn't it interesting that America is the largest Gentile nation in the world that has funded and preached the gospel message 
in all corners of the world. Isn't it interesting that America is the only nation that can claim that they were founded on Christian principles? No other nation can make that claim. And we're the only nation in the world that can trace our origins and prophetic patterns all the way back to Israel. Long before America was ever thought of as a nation of Israel, uh, the nation of Israel was destroyed and its people were scattered. God knew in the end times that he would again return and dealing with his Jewish children in order to, to, to do so, they would once again have to be a nation. America has played an instrumental part in the rebirth of the nation of Israel. They are now a nation. And America played an instrumental part. But did you know that hundreds of years earlier, it was the Jews who played an instrumental part in seeing that the United States of America was born? Before we ever helped them to become a state, Jews had a great part in the founding of our country. We're a unique nation, folks. We have a, a, a unique, divinely anointed job to do. We're called to take God's message to a nation, to the world. And when that job is done, our time here on this earth is also going to be done. America, or more specifically, Christian America, can find itself in the Bible as what I believe the new husbandman of God's vineyard. God has lent us, lent us the spiritual privilege that we want, that He had once given to Israel because they didn't share this privilege with the world like they were supposed to. But I want you to notice that God has only rented us the vineyard. It's not ours. It belongs to Him. And when, when we have brought forth the fruit unto the harvest. He will come back and take us home to be with Him. And I believe that this is why America can't easily be pointed to in any verse of Scripture that uh, clearly identifies them as being present in the last days. I think America, the superpower, won't exist in the last days. Because our work, listen, our work is going to be done. Our spiritual privileges will be uh, returned to Israel in the tribulation period, will be returned to Israel, and the church will be taken away. That's that Christian privilege of America will be taken out in the rapture of the church. So when the Christians are gone, when God's blessings and provision no longer rest on our nation, America. I believe America will no longer have the power that she now has. And that's why the United States doesn't appear to have a role in the end time events. Now I know that I've thrown a lot of things at you this morning. A lot of teaching. It may be confusing to understand. I suggest that you might want to re-watch this on Facebook or YouTube and take your time and listen carefully to what I've said. And remember, if you forget everything else, remember this. Our job today, till Jesus comes, is to tend the garden, tend the vineyard. It's our job to share the gospel of Jesus Christ until He comes back again. Shall we pray?